So the object tonight is going to be the elephant trunk. Uh, it's a good object for, uh, especially for the focal length that I've got, which is about 400. So what I'll do, regardless of whatever I'm shooting, is I'll take it into Telescopius in order to uh, just do it more or less for framing uh, reference. And the good thing about using Telescopius with an ASI Air is that if you want to specifically move to a region or, let's say, create a mosaic, you can do that and copy the coordinates and then import those into ASI Air. But the other thing I really like about Telescopius is that you can pick and choose your profiles in order to figure out exactly what you want to use and what it would look like uh, framed up. And it does it with actual real pictures, so very, very convenient. So when I get that information together, what I do at that point, if, if I'm not doing a mosaic, is I'll just go ahead and fire off into the ASI Air. Now one of the things I don't, uh, still don't care for on the ASI Air is that if you change telescopes, you, you, you have to change the information into it. It's basically a one size fits all. So if you change your focal length on a different scope, you gotta go in and change that as well. Uh, there, you don't basically have a, oh, what do you call it? Profile, that's what I was thinking of, for profile. You don't have separate profiles, so. But once I fire it off, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, I'll go ahead and go ahead and turn on the uh, power to the camera. If it's gonna be a specifically uh, dewy kind of a night if there's a lot of moisture in there i'll go ahead and put my dew heaters on now here too that's another thing i don't particularly care for that you know they have on pegasus and uh, a couple of other you know computers uh astronomy computers so to speak is that you can put a temperature gauge onto it and it will turn on or off the dew heaters based on that temperature in the ambient environment etc so that would be kind of nice if they could add that on eventually but yeah who knows so, uh, of course, changing from scopes, uh, I had done a little bit of rework on the uh, FRA 400 here, so I'm completely out of focus, uh, and basically the only thing you can really do, uh, especially with the ZWO focuser, is, uh, you know, there's no way to manually pull it uh, to where you can, you know, manually turn the wheel. Unfortunately, you have to disconnect it. Uh, there's no clutch system in it. So, you know, I'll sit here and play with this for a while. Normally, if I know where I'm at and I have a number, uh, I will write that down. So that way, if I go back to it, I've got a reference point that will at least start me off. Unfortunately, I had to start cold on this particular one. But once I got it into focus, then it's easy enough just to go ahead and run a uh, autofocus on it since you get it kind of close. And after that, you're pretty much good to go. You know, one of the things that you're supposed to do uh, before you go into an autofocus is to pull it up on this box here and you try to manually adjust it to get it as close as you possibly can uh, in order to start your autofocus. But honestly, I don't really do that too much. I just eyeball it uh, and get it fairly close. Uh, and then after that, I'll just go ahead and let it run on, a, on the automatic autofocus. But uh, putting it on the box, is, to me, it's just a little bit tedious, especially if you can see it well. Uh, and in some cases, especially if you're shooting with some sort of a light pollution filter, you're actually better off to go ahead and change your bending to 2x2 two two, uh, initially in order to find the star. Otherwise, it might get lost in the noise, which I've had to do that a couple of times. But uh, yeah, you know, w once you kind of get the feel of it right off the bat, you tend not to have to use that box. Though it does help, uh, depending on what this, the transparency or the seeing is. But personally, I just eyeball it, click it, let it go. And as you can see, it does a fine job just go ahead and dialing in the way it's supposed to be. Now, I am kind of backing up here just a minute because I didn't do this when I initially started, but I am setting it up for station mode. Uh, the reason being is I am running it with an Ethernet to a uh, little, uh, little wall router, a little simple wall router, which has both 5 and 2.5 gigahertz channels on it. So I'm plugging that into there and then going back and setting the unit actually to station mode uh, so that I've got a little bit more distance on it. Uh, and that being the case, I can then carry uh, my iPad throughout the house wherever I'm at. So yeah, it, it actually works fairly well, a lot better than I think than putting something on the outside or trying to wirelessly connect to it. So using the ethernet seems to do a perfectly fine job. And then moving on, we're gonna go straight into polar alignment. And uh, I actually like how easy the polar alignment feature is on this. It seems like they took a lot of the, the good stuff that, uh, like, say, from the original, like the, the original Pole Master, and later on the iPolar, and then also to, you know, you can do it with uh, 
oh, I can't remember the name of the program now, but along the same lines, it's using the, the main camera in order to uh, figure out where it's at, and you can, at that point, use it in order to uh, polar align. But, yeah, it, th this process is actually fairly easy, and it, th the fact that it's automated is awesome. Now, I will go back and I will do this at least two times, sometimes three, and it actually suggests for you to do that. Uh, just to get better pointing accuracy, accuracy. Now, it doesn't improve your guiding accuracy, but it does improve on the pointing accuracy, which uh, is also kind of important, probably more for visual than anything. But when you're doing slews and plate solves, uh, it helps to be pretty much dead to nuts on it. And actually, let me rephrase that. So it, being well polar aligned also does help with guiding, but in the sense of uh, you need to be very well polar aligned, uh, at least within a couple of arc minutes, for better guiding. So, little caveat to that: uh, yeah, you need to be you you need a good polar alignment. And again, if I run it two or three times, chances are it's gonna I'm gonna dial it down definitely under a minute. And in this particular case, you'll see that it's you know, it takes a little time to kind of get close to it. One of the things you always got to keep in mind is you know when you're out at this one degree. Uh, positioning and you're trying to dial into two and then later into four uh, little movements go a long way and especially if you look at your refresh rate there um, depending on how many seconds it's taking if you are making adjustments and it hasn't caught up with you yet at some point you're still making adjustments and it hasn't done anything but it is a little bit it isn't where it's supposed to be and you wind up overshooting all the time so it took me a little while to figure that out, especially two seconds. And you'll see every now and then it gets a little hung up. And then when you get start getting down into you know these more finite movements, again, you just got to take your time when you're doing it and not try to rush it through. Now, there are times when, for whatever reason, it'll just hang up. And uh, sometimes you just have to kind of stop it, restart it, see what it does. In this particular case, I was so far out. I mean, I was probably 21 minutes, I think that once I did get moved in close enough, which is like around three or four minutes, sometimes then I'll just go ahead and restart it because if there's obviously been so much movement to get it closer to alignment because I was so far out of whack. Sometimes it, it hangs up that way. I'm not sure why it does it, but it's not a big deal. Um, again, you can just stop it and restart it. And uh, usually I'll just put the telescope right back to uh, zero point and then just start it all over again. So it'll run through uh, you know, a second time here, and uh, it also helps me check to see where I left off at. And I think I was somewhere around what three, right, three or four arc minutes. I think. I think. Uh, so when it comes back up, usually if I'm right around those same numbers, then it, it's still doing fairly accurately. So yeah, about four minutes. There you go. So yeah, I'll just keep dialing this in and uh, trying to get as close as I possibly can. I don't think I've ever gotten this perfectly. Um, but I haven't done bad either, you know, dialing it in. Again, usually I'm in arc seconds, not, uh, not in arc minutes. And quite honestly, you know, if you're, if you're less than three minutes, uh, you're probably going to be okay, especially if you're doing wide field. Uh, unfortunately, I am a perfectionist to a degree. And like right here, I'd probably be fine with that, you know, minute, 16 seconds. But, you know, yeah, I'm going to sit here and screw with it at least for another five or ten minutes to try to get it as close as low as I possibly can. It, and that's just a OCD thing. And I'm not saying OCD like, uh, <laughs> you know, pretend OCD. Like I, I really do have OCD. Um, and as you can see, this is what I talked about. Sometimes if you're doing it too quickly uh, before it has a time to refresh and then to do another plate solve, you can shoot right on by it. And th this is where it starts getting a little tedious for me because... I'm trying to dial it in, trying to dial it in, trying to dial it in, and I wind up throwing myself back out again past that one minute mark, and then I just kind of start it all over again. Of course, you know, you're watching this jump around quite a bit just because of editing, um, but you'll see, or as you're looking at, you know, I'm down to 15 arc seconds, which is probably more than adequate, but I always try to beat myself. I always try to get a little bit better. Uh, sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Again, once I've done this process and I get down this close, I'll go ahead and run it at least one more time. And that is just to basically validate that I am where I am and what I'm doing. So we're not going to go through this more. Let's just go ahead and skip ahead. 
Now, one of the things I did have to do was since I moved around my rig from one to the other is I had to go and refocus my guide camera. Now, what I've found the easiest way to do that is to just go into your main camera settings and change out uh, your, your main camera for your guide scope camera. And then you can basically use the uh, focus feature um, that you have here. Now, obviously, you can't use an autofocus because you probably don't have an autofocuser on uh, your actual guide camera. But since I'm shooting with an off-axis guider uh, and basically the main camera is already in focus and my focuser going on to the OAG has a helical uh, adjustment on it. So that's where I'll just disconnect the 071 in this particular point and I'll flip it over to the 290 which brings it up onto the main uh, site here, the main picture and then I'll use that in order to manually focus myself in so that's all you're seeing right here is just me manually using the helical focuser on the OAG in order to dial it in since I did change it up <music> So, you know, you also have the ability uh, with the SIR to go into the tonight's best feature uh, if you're not quite sure what to shoot at, though. Uh, I find it a little bit cumbersome. Now, you can filter it down uh, a little bit to try to make your choices easier, but quite honestly, um, it's good for what it is. It's a good database for what it is, but uh, yeah, let's, I'll go into here, uh, pick the topic of what it is and then I'll go ahead and slew over there uh, wherever the object is. I won't actually start the plan yet but I'll just send it over there. Now the reason, a couple of reasons why I'm doing that. One, uh, I knew for a fact that this object was starting uh, to come up a little bit late and usually I can't start shooting until something gets about 30 degrees or higher if I'm facing due north due to a, a, a ridge line that runs just above me. So uh, what I'll do is go ahead and go over there, especially if I know I'm close, and basically all I'm looking for is to make sure uh, that I'm not behind a tree, which, you know, 9 out of 10 times if I'm starting an object this early and knowing that it's not quite past that 30 degree mark after it gets dark, then usually, yeah, I'm starting to shoot it through a tree limb or something, and i got to wait for it to come up. So the only other reason why I would uh, do this even if I knew how high it was, is also to just to, to get a, a rough idea of sky glow and, uh, and uh, you know, just to check positioning and see where I'm at and maybe even do, you know, once I get on there, I may just go ahead and start at the guider and instead of actually shooting a thing, I may do several test exposures just to see, you know, what's going to be best for me this evening. So sure enough, as you can see, there is the tree, a little, little bit of a tree limb in the upper left-hand corner there. Uh, so usually I'll just let it sit there and I'll go back and do a couple of update exposures just every now and then until finally it's out of the way. But as you can see, it's still there. So I think uh, maybe I la went like about 10 or 15 minutes, I believe, um, before I was finally able to get past that, which is fine because I'm still you know doing other things and getting ready for the evening. So not that big of a deal but then this is also too where i'll go ahead and start doing the planning getting all that stuff done while i'm waiting for that tree limb to clear now since i did change the focus on my guide camera and did change its position i do need to go in in order to recalibrate uh, in the asi air so you can go in and clear the calibration in order to start off fresh which I've heard some people say you should do it every single time. I've heard other people say, no, just only do it if you move your guide camera. Um, I'm kind of in between. I'll do it either way. It just depends. But on this particular evening, just said, screw it, go ahead and recalibrate because I knew, obviously, and you saw earlier that I had to adjust the uh, focus on it, which has now turned that camera. So what the SI air thinks is north, south, east, and west. Chances are I've changed that, and it doesn't meet this doesn't you know mean the same thing. So, you know, unless you're pulling it apart and, and disconnecting it or refocusing or changing positions of the camera, you're probably fine without doing a calibration. But you know, if there's any doubt, it only takes a few minutes for it to do, and then once it's recalibrated and it goes back to guiding. I'll actually just kind of let it sit for a while 
after the calibration and guide just so that it can uh, work out its own bugs, which is what it's basically doing here now is uh, going through the calibration. And then once it finishes, I'll just let it sit there and guide for a few minutes. So while it's guiding and slowing down and I'm waiting for that branch to move, I'm just doing some test exposures here. Now, if you see in that lower left corner there with the little star signs there with the Big Dipper, uh, this is new. This was on the update here just uh, not too long ago, more recent than not. Uh, and it's the ability to be able to go in and to control this. Uh, well, it does several things. One is you can uh, do a point-click slew. Uh, it's to find objects, it's for lining up your objects, and you can at this point, and again, if you remember what I was talking earlier about in telescopias, if you didn't like the way it was framed up and you wanted to concentrate on a different area, you can move the box and then use that as your solve point for your, when, you, when you go to set up your, uh, your actual framing. So you do now have the ability to manually frame it uh, from the ASI air, which so now it does not require uh, Telescopius to do that to get the coordinates from Telescopius. Uh, but of course, if you are doing a mosaic, then yes, you would still have to import them. But a lot of cool features that are in there. So you obviously just saw there was the equatorial grid, and you have landscape, you can turn it on and off. You can pull out of it, you can see uh, you know where it's located in the sky. And it's actually pretty interesting. It was kind of fun just to kind of mess around and play with it. Certainly you can do much more, and again, you can do a, a point and slew, which is a nice feature now. You're not having to star hop, which you should learn how to do anyway, but if not, yeah, you got a simple, easier way in order to do it. And it's nice that it actually will factor in uh, the size of your scope and the camera uh, as far as looking at it in this particular view, because that's the information you entered on it. So with the test shot done, basically, uh, yeah, looks like I'm pretty much where I want to be. Now, obviously, you can't see a whole lot with this right now. Obviously, uh, well, depending on whatever screen you're looking at it on, it's actually a little hard to see even on the iPad. I am shooting with a L Extreme uh, filter on this here. So basically, I'm looking for a couple of things. One is there's a nasty little uh, halo going on on that damn star, but... I'm just checking for positioning and I'm checking for streaking stars because I had this set up for uh, 300 second exposures. So when I'm happy and I'm ready to go, then it's just to go ahead and set up the uh, shooting sequence to get the shooting schedule going on. And that's all I'm going to do right here is enter in all the information, what I want to do, how many lights, how many uh, targets, uh, if I'm going to be doing darks, uh, flats, etc afterwards so uh, this is all where I'm putting this together which typically I just go ahead and run all of my lights and then the following day I'll run darks as well as the biases well actually I don't even shoot biases anymore but I'll run the flats and the flat darks and that's pretty much it I press go and uh, it'll ask me to, when I get done do you want me to shut down go to home and I say yes I do and I let it rip, and uh, of course it was already guiding there at that particular time, which uh, the guiding number looks pretty good. Uh, and once the first one or two, maybe even three uh, exposures to come down, I'll uh, stay with it. But then after that, it's pretty much, you know, point and shoot and go on my merry way. So what did I end up with? 